Don't break my heart, my achy break. And I loved uh, high school. I had uh, braces. I was five foot three, um, so I was shorter then. And um, and uh, I was I was in love with this girl. She was a year older than me. I thought she was the greatest. I was just thought like, man, I think she's the one. You know how it is in high school. And. Uh, my dad had systematically taken each one of his kids out uh, to spend time one-on-one since we were six. And so my dad decided that if Jesus could make disciples, uh, he could make disciples, not just in the local church, but make disciples of his family. And so um, everybody had a day to spend time alone with dad. So Monday was Debbie Day. My, my mom had a date with my dad. Tuesday was David Day. Wednesday, Dana Day. Thursday, Deborah Day. Friday, Daniel Day. And each one of us from the time that we were six had time alone with my dad, to which you would say that sounds like a big commitment. It was. Um, and my dad made that investment in me. And so uh, it wasn't really until I got into junior high that I knew that I needed it. So in elementary school, it just felt like we were hanging out. I never had problems in elementary school. Life was good. But in junior high, I had had all kinds of crisis. And in high school, I had crisis. And my dad had made so many spiritual and emotional and biblical deposits in me one chunk at a time, uh, starting on Tuesdays all the way through elementary school, that then he was able to make emotional withdrawals in my junior high years and high school years. And I say that to say because he told me to make decisions Um, in regard to friendships and dating. uh, And I was willing to do whatever he said because we were close. And I knew uh, that he knew Jesus. And I wanted to know Jesus like he knew Jesus. And so um, when I I was 16, we were sitting at a Bennigan's uh, in Northwest Oklahoma City. And um, usually our time was about an hour. When I was younger, it was about 30 minutes. Um, and, uh, and I began to just, just tell him about this new uh, rejection I was experiencing uh, where I had a crush on a girl and she didn't like me back. And um, that was common for me in that season of life. And, um, <laughs> and so I was telling my dad. And, uh, but I was a mess. I mean, you think I'm crying right now. Whew, you should have seen me then. And um, so I'm just like unloading these tears to my dad, um, 16 years old, sitting in a booth, and, um, and I'm telling about this girl that doesn't like me and I'm all emotional. And, and my dad says, David, I'll, I'll be back in just a second. And he got up and um, walked to a payphone. If you're under 30, you're like, what is that? Don't worry about it. And he uh, walked to this payphone and he came back and he said, all right, we've got all night. Um, you, just, you can keep crying, son. You can keep telling me your story. And I said, what are you talking about? And you have your board meeting tonight. And he goes, no, 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 I, I canceled the board meeting. Yeah. I said, Dad, you can't cancel your board meeting. Uh, <laughs> that's, your, that's your church. And I'll just never forget, my dad's the opposite of me. He's tall, dark, and handsome, and he's... <laughs> He's real, he's real soft-spoken. I don't know how, I mean, how I ended up his kid, but uh, he just looked at me, and he's real quiet, just real whisper. I said, Dad, that's your church. I'm crying. And he goes, David, first and foremost, you're my church. And, uh, man, it, it, he lived it, and he shaped me. And, and really where I want to go in these special minutes that I have with you is I want to challenge you, Pastor, uh, to make your family your first church. And so you may have a church of 50 or you may have a church of 5,000, but I want to invite you to think about what it looks like in terms of beginning with the end in mind and then backpedaling and saying, how do I, how do I create my time, my structure, my life around the conviction that my family is really my first church? Um, it's what shaped, significantly shaped me. And when I look at Jesus uh, and you look at, Today, the Church of Jesus Christ, 2,000 years after Jesus was here. And there are obviously um, churches all over the world. And we see that it's big in size. Um, We see that the Church of Jesus is global. There's actually today um, believers and the Church of Jesus in every nation on earth. There's still people groups. But we're living in a generation where it's unprecedented um, that there's actually believers in, nation, in every nation. 
And we've got a ton of work to do with global evangelism, but it's massive. The, the church of Jesus for 2,000 years has been growing and it's, and, and, I, and I look back at how Jesus invested his time and he invested his time in a few. He invested his time in 12 and in three and then specifically in one. And we've got a little window of time. Each of you are different in terms of where you're at in terms of the actual age of your children. But I wanna invite you to think about making disciples of your children the way that Jesus made disciples and to think of your children as your first church. So my first church is not my staff. I love my staff and I've got a great staff and uh, I enjoy them, but they're not my first church. My first church is not our elders and my first church is not my small group that meets with a bunch of dudes on Thursdays at noon. My first church is my kids. And I just want you to think about what it would look like for you if deep in your bones you began to think about not tolerating your kids in this season, not trying to just make it through this season with them, but maybe living on less money, maybe giving less in, in, in ministry in your context, doing less, so that you could be intentional to disciple your children. And I think specifically we can look at the life of Jesus and learn how to make disciples the way that Jesus made disciples and consider if you've got three kids that are nine, 11, and 13, that that is your Peter, James, and John. That more than the three staff members or the, the three people that run small groups or whatever, that your first commitment is to them. And will that affect the size of your church? Yeah, I think probably so. Uh, I, but now I look and I, I think about the way that Jesus invested in a few and we've got our kids in our home for just a little bit of time. And my, my, I'm confident that 30 years from now or 20 years from now, there's gonna be zero regrets if I invested my time, my dollars into making disciples of my kids and helping them come to know Jesus. So for David, for my life, my number one commitment, more than any, uh, more, I love the prayer meeting and I've been preaching about prayer meetings for 20 years and I'm committed to the prayer meeting at our church. I'm committed to evangelism. I'm committed to small groups. I think that the local church is the hope of the world. I believe all that stuff. I, I, I believe all that. I'm, I'm in, I'm in on all that. But none of that is bigger than this little window of time that I've got my, 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 my little tribe, right? Which now my tribe is getting big and Dawson's 14 and he's taller than I am. And this is his jacket because he's cooler than I am. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he looks just like Renata, which is, anyway, so, uh, which is good for him. And, but, those, but, but th that's, that's my first calling. That's, that's, that's who God's called me to, to disciple right now. And so Dawson, right now he's 14 and wants to be a, a pastor, which is awesome. And Olivia, she's 13 and, and she's got a heart to serve. It was amazing. Um, when we moved to plant our church in 2016 in Kansas City, out of, out of, she'd always been a servant, but she just began to aggressively make multiple meals per week and clean the house frequently. And Renata said to Olivia, so she was 11, Olivia, what's, what's going on? Why, I'm gonna cry. Guys, I'm sorry I'm so emotional. This has been a very emotional time in my life. <laughs> Renata, my wife said to Olivia, why are you suddenly helping so much? And Olivia said, when I was spending time with God, I, I told God I would do whatever he wanted, <laughs> trying to not cry, uh, whatever he wanted me to do for our church. And I, she said, I wrote in my journal that I felt like the Lord told me to help you, mom. And so for these last few years, like she's like, I mean, she's just like this. I mean, she's, she does ballet too. So she kind of floats around and <laughs> she's always just like cleaning. I mean, she's Cinderella. I mean, it's unreal. And, and, and Adeline, uh, my 11, my, she's 11 now. Now, out of my four kids, this is the one that looks the most like me. Like, so my wife, Renata, she has brown hair and she has brown eyes, and, and, then, and then I don't. And so 
All the, the three of them look just like Renata, but then there's Adeline who looks just like me. She's shorter than the rest of them. She's got blue eyes. She's got blonde hair. And so when she was three, I got down on one knee and I looked at her and I put my hands on her cheeks. And I, was, I said, Adeline, so three years old, Adeline, when I look at you, I see me. You know, and it's kind of just relief, like, oh, I got, I got one kid that looks like me, you know? And, and she put her hands on my cheeks and said, Daddy, when I look at you, I see you. <laughs> and I thought, you look like me and you're just as bright as I am. Yeah, you know, like, whoo, that's a deep thought. So, but, <laughs> but, but these four, you know, like these kids, and obviously my wife, Renata, these are the ones um, that I'm called to disciple. And that's the nail I want to drive in. That's the, the drum that I want to beat. Psalm 127 says this, and you know it well because you're pastors, but it says this. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. Gift of the Lord. Write it down, mark it, highlight it. Tear stain, blood, whatever you got to do. You gotta, we gotta lock in and believe that in our bones, a gift. Hard, yes. Challenging, yes. Problems, yes. Expensive, yes. <laughs> gift, yes. The fruit of the womb is a reward. And here it is, like arrows in the hand of a warrior. So are the children of one's youth. I was reading Erwin McManus's book and I liked the book, but I loved the dedication. Listen to this. This is the dedication to his book called The Last Arrow. Long after, <clears throat> to my arrows, Aaron and Mariah, his son and his daughter. Long after I rest my bow and have struck my last arrow, <clears throat> there will still be arrows flying true. Their names are Aaron and Mariah the trajectories of their lives will take them far beyond the ground I have taken. You are the future and this is your flight. I pulled the bow back as far as I could and gave you all the strength I had to send you into flight. Fly far and true, cross enemy lines, hit the mark, set captives free. Who wants a dad like that? Well, here's a few thoughts, I'll just give you a few. First one is this, how do I? How do I make disciples of my kids, David? Thanks for the inspiring little stories. How do I do it? Here's a few things I see. Number one, speak life into their hearts. Speak life into your children's hearts, your language, the way that you talk. Um, if we wanna know how to father, we learn from our heavenly father. So study the heavenly father. You could say father, you could say parent. But let's just look at the way that the heavenly father speaks to his son. How does the first person of the Trinity speak to the second? How does God the father audibly speak to his son? You know the text. Let's just break it down and look at a few ideas in it. Matthew chapter three, verse 16. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and, al <clears throat> and alighting on him. He, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love with whom I am well pleased. So I see three things here that we can speak. Number one is this, acceptance. This is my son. Number two, affection, whom I love. Number three, affirmation, with whom I am well pleased. Three phrases to get deep into our hearts, into our minds as we look and speak to our children. Obviously, different ages. Whenever you talk about parenting, there's always lots of dialogue. Well, my kids are this different age, you know, and I get that. So apply it to however age it works for them. But these ideas, you're my son. You're my daughter, you're my girl. I love you, I'm so proud of you. This is my son, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. Accepted, loved, affirmed, acceptance, affection, affirmation. Or you could say it this way, you belong, you are loved, and you matter. You belong, you are loved, and you matter. And so any way to help bring this kind of idea of acceptance, you are accepted. This is the grace message. 
This is the message of you are loved even when you're weak, you are loved even when you're broken, you are loved even when you're not perfect, you are loved even when you don't perform well. You are accepted. I've got you, you're all right, you're gonna be okay. And we do this in every way that we can with our kids. You belong here, you're a part of this family. And this is obviously the, pa- the family picture thing. This is however you can think of doing it, but this is our family, this is our tribe. You belong in this house, you're accepted. One of the things that Renata and I do is every time we get in the car for our Sabbath day, which for us is Fridays, is we, since they were babies, we started singing family songs. So I write songs. Uh, I'm not good, but I, I, I write songs. And so we have quite a few of them. And now my son is 14. He has a deep voice and he still sings these family songs, right? Because it's been part of the culture. So like just a few days ago, We got in the car, we're driving out on Sabbath and we're singing, take me out with my family, take me out with my friends. We'll sing together and laugh and play. It's gonna be a super fun day cause it's Dawson Perkins, the leader. Olivia Faith, the princess, that was when she was three. Adeline Grace is a movie star. Justice is yelling in the back of the car and it's mommy passing out Chick-fil-A. Daddy screams hip hooray. Let's all start by praising King Jesus for giving us this day. Hooray! Right? Like that. And so, thank you very much. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be singing with Corey Asbury in the afternoon session. Right? It's called The Father's Reckless Love. And it's not going to happen. Um... But it's creating that idea of you belong. Lots of different ways to do it. But what I hear from the Heavenly Father is this voice. This is my son. It's you belong. You're mine. I've got you. And I think fathers and mothers, every single possible way that we can do this, that we can get that in them. And we speak it. It's the speaking of you belong. It's a speaking of I love you. We know this, but we got to do this in every way that you can. Say it. Text it. Post it, sing it. I mean, especially if, you, if you've got little kids, it's declaring it, getting it in them. Not the, well, you already know this, but no. We have the Heavenly Father saying it to the, to the Son, audibly interrupting human history. Just instead of your own ego going, well, I'm too masculine for that. Nah, bank on the Heavenly Father does it for His Son. Audibly declares, interrupts human history with, this is my Son whom I love. I just think it's good. I think that we lock in with saying it. You belong and you're loved. I love I love you, I delight in you, I like you, I enjoy you, verbal, and putting it however you can. Renata and I, I mean, one of the things we did is we took a picture with our kids, put a scripture verse, framed it, and put it by their bed. So their whole lives, they think it's normal to have a picture of your parents right next to your wall as you go to sleep. (laughs) You go, that sounds like some narcissistic people. No, man, I'm just trying to get it in their heads. Hey, you're loved. And the last thing you see at night is your parents waving over you. You are loved. (laughs) Saying prayers, singing songs. Now, I've been doing the same thing that my dad did, where I just take each one out. And my, I travel more than my dad traveled, so then I tend to end up stacking them some days. I find myself on one day just stacking multiple one-on-ones with my kids. Drop off the next kid. I know each of their favorite places. I mean, with Olivia, we always go to Dairy Queen. That's what she wants, right? That's, that's her thing. Dawson, he always wants to drink a Coke. I spend, so in the little restaurants around my house, I, 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 spend, I spend 10 bucks a week, confession. I spend 10 bucks a week on stupid little snacks. But I know that that $2.50 that I'm investing one-on-one with each kid is priceless. Because I get these conversations and I'm, I'm, I mean, I can tell you right now, I can tell you what's going on in their lives. I know exactly what's going on in Dawson's life. And I've been, I've been making this kid go out with me one-on-one since he was three. And now he's 14 and I know, I just know. I'm not going to say it because this is being recorded, but I know, I know his journey. I know where he, I know what's going on with him and the Lord. I know what he thinks of the scriptures. I know where he's at with girls. I know, I know exactly what he's thinking about where he wants to go with his career. I know Olivia, she is so different than him. 
She's a whole different, I mean, but I know. And, you, and, and it's just taking time to, to listen, ask questions. I wanna invite you to think through, look at the heavenly father, the way that he speaks over his son. You belong, this is my son, whom I loved and then with whom I'm well pleased. Every child needs to know you matter. Hey, you know what? You belong, you're loved, and, and you matter. Like what, the, what God has on your life, the way that God's gonna use you, 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 you matter to me. And we see this, we even see Paul as a spiritual father doing this, right? If you just read even the epistles, I find Paul always giving shout outs, you matter, right? In Philippians, he's given Timothy and Epaphroditus who risked his life, Hey, I'm gonna throw you in the letter here. I'm gonna give you a shout out. You matter. Ephesians, he does it with Tychicus, a brother and a servant, gives him a verbal shout out. Colossians, with Epaphras, always wrestling for you in prayer. He's giving these verbal shout outs. He's just saying, hey, what you're doing matters. And in every little ministry, that you can with your kids as you not only get their hearts connected to Jesus, but then help them get connected who they are in the family, get them connected to the spiritual gifts that are on their lives and then starting to verbalize it. So I just tell my kids all the time, hey, Adeline Grace. So she leads a prayer meeting. So we have load in at 6.30 in the morning on Sundays, which means that I'm leaving my house with our kids at 6.05. And, uh, and, and, and so for me, you know, like planning the church, I, 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 had, a safe, I had a safe job at a big church and, and I was kind of nervous about this church planting thing. And what I found is that in being on mission together in a new, fresh way, it's united us. And, and, and the weight of it has not crushed them. And I think a big part of it has been these one-on-ones. That's why I'm telling you about it. But I'm trying to get locked in with them, hey, you, you are loved you're, you're, and, and you matter. And it's this idea. So like Olivia, she started doing, when we have, uh, we call it church in, we do church in on Sunday mornings and, and there'd be all these adults that were loading in, but there was lots of little kids. And so Adeline uh, came up with this idea of, dad, she's 11. What if I led a prayer meeting for the little kids during load in? And so, now for me to verbalize to her, hey, not only are you, are you loved and do you belong, but what you're doing with those kids, it matters. Hey, Olivia, the ministry that you have to your mom by helping her, it matters. Hey, Dawson, the way that you're helping with production in our little church plant, it matters, right? And communicating, all right, you are loved, you belong, you matter. We see that in Jesus. And being that mother or being that father that sees them, that loves them. I know this is a lot, but this session is an hour, all right? So I wanna tell you this story, all right? So for my dad, one of the reasons why my dad is a great dad was because he had a great dad. And some of you hear that and you think, well, I didn't have a great dad, and so it's hard for me to be a great dad. Okay, you be the first great dad in your family legacy, right? right? And so just be fathered by your heavenly father. And I'm not saying get over it. I'm not, that's not like, I'm not saying, I'm just saying have that resolution. But my dad tells the story of uh, when he was a kid, eight years old, went to a uh, Nazarene church where they had hardwood floors in Butte, Montana, church of about 35 to 40 people. And the, the hardwood floors were slanted and at the front were wooden altars. And so my dad would do anything to survive the boring preacher every Sunday, right? And so he tells the story of pulling out the hymnal and taking out his marbles on a Sunday and lining them up to look at the marbles, you know where this is going, in the hymnal. And he tells the story of getting all of his marbles just right and then realizing he'd forgotten one and reaching back to get the marble and dropped his marbles. <laughs> and the marbles went <laughs> hit the floor. And then hardwood floor slanted, rolled all the way to the front. <laughs> and then hit the altar at the front. <laughs> and my eight-year-old father leans back in the pew like this. And the organist 
in that day, stayed on stage, never left the stage, and just stopped and stared at my dad. And the preacher stopped preaching and just glared at my dad, just stopped. And then my dad looked over, two sections, men sat on one side and women sat on the other, different day. And, <laughs> and, and he's got like, ever, all, like all of the ladies in the church like staring at him. He looks, he's sitting with his dad on this side and men from behind, my dad's in the back staring and the whole church staring at my dad. And he tells the story of in that moment, <laughs> he felt this hand just, just tapping him on the shoulder. And he looked up you know, at his dad and his dad was the only set of eyes in the building that weren't looking at him. Just staring right back at the preacher, you know, saying, <laughs> it's my boy <laughs> whom I love <laughs> whom I'm well pleased and my, when my dad tells the story he talks about on that day in the moment where he felt everybody looking at him as a failure he had a father that loved him where he felt loved and I'm just encouraging you to speak it and in addition, whatever you can do to speak life, declare life, speak affection, you are loved, you belong, you matter. I see that as number one. Number two is this, connect their hearts to Jesus. Connect their hearts to Jesus. Now, I think in our culture, there's... Uh, Sometimes we don't know what the win is, what the touchdown is, what the center of the target is and when it comes to parenting. And here's what I wanna encourage you is the center of the target. Here's what I wanna encourage you is the touchdown. The win is not that they would just be good citizens. The win is not that they would be great athletes. The win is not that they would be scholars. All those things are fine, but as I'm looking at pastors, I wanna tell you, here is what I believe to be the touchdown. Here's the center of the target. Here's the win. You wanna connect their hearts to Jesus. You get that and you get everything. Even if they perform poorly, even if they're never a scholar, even if they're never athletic, even if they go through major behavioral problems, if you get their heart connected to Christ, you gain everything. Your win as a father or mother is to be a disciple maker. Your win is not to survive the teen years. Your win is to make disciples of your teens while they're in your house. So I love the illustration of the Matthew Emmons, the 2004 uh, riflery Olympics uh, shooting on behalf of America. And he goes back and he goes to, sh goes to shoot and he's by far and above the best in the Olympics, representing America, 2004. All he has to do is hit the target. Doesn't have to hit the bullseye on his last shot. And if he hits the target, he wins gold. Goes back, fires, not just the target, he hits bullseye. And in his mind, gold, baby. But he looks up and drops to eighth place because he hit the bullseye on the wrong target. Here's what I wanna tell you. You live in a culture that applauds a different bullseye than Christianity. And your temptation is to just get all of them kind of well. Like, let's just, let's, let's just try to get the minivan right. Let's try to have behavior be right. Let's try to have them be athletes. Let's just make sure they get double digits on their ACT. Let's just, let's just survive these years. Here's the win. I'm telling you, here is the win. The win is they have relationship with Jesus. That's the win. Now, I get it. We want a safe environment. We want to pastor them when they go through some good days and some hard days some days where they, where they turn their back and their prodigals. I get that. I, I know that. I got that. But I'm talking about as you strategize, as you think through these precious years that you've got them, 
You wanna create, here's the ultimate win. And there's lots of different ways that we could talk about how to accomplish that goal. I wanna invite you to push out some of the other things so that you can clearly have that goal. So that you can say the center of the target, the center is I want them to know Christ. It's Philippians 3, I want them to know Christ. Whether they sing your praises or not, whether they do well, honestly, student council or whatever, all these good things, but there's one God thing you wanna make sure they get. That's that to the best that you can, and you can't force it. It's voluntary love coming from their heart. It is their own relationship, but you're doing everything you can far more than you care about even their college savings or where they go to college or who, I mean, if you get that, you get everything. So if that's true, then you begin with that as your end game. Then even as I'm talking about some processes, some systems, you, you, you work on your own systems, but you can establish that's, that's ultimately my win. And so for me, that's my win. And so my time, you can look at my calendar and know that my kids walking with Jesus is one of my big wins. And and I'm not telling you to do my systems. I I do a system that works for you. But that for me, that looks like on Sabbath, one day a week, we go out to a, I mean, we go out to an expensive coffee shop. And I'm like, you're like, hey, you could just do that with Folgers at your house. But there's something about my, my, you know, like, hipster town where you got to spend four dollars on a pour over you know like but I take my kids out and once a week we're having a conversation about what's going on with their relationship with the Lord all of us together and then one day a week I'm with one of them spending time talking about what's going on and and I don't I don't spend there's some things I don't spend money on right I mean we, we came to the airport yesterday in a Suburban that has 207,000 miles on it, 2001. I'm gonna drive that thing until the day I die, right? I don't, I don't care about cars, but my daughter, Olivia, she's, she's got a $60 journal. <laughs> you know why? Because she wanted it. And that's the journal where she's spending time with God. And I didn't bat an eye. A $60 journal, I never heard of a $60 journal before. <laughs> But she's got one now. You know why? Because man, that's what I care about. Like I want, I want you. And so we're, I'm, all, I'm buying them new Bibles all the time. I'll spend anything for highlighters. I'll pay extra money for hipster coffee, whatever it takes. But here's, 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 here's the win. Here's the touchdown. Here's the goal. Here's the, here is my bullseye. My bullseye. I don't really care if they end up great athletes. And I know I offended all the athletes in the room. And I know that you can be a great athlete for the glory of God and that you can use athleticism to reach people. I got all that. I mean, with my genes, it's not going to happen anyway. So (laughs) I'm just going to (laughs) punt. Give up on that dream, baby. And so, no, but for me, it's right, right at the center. I go, I, 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 here's what I care about. And so here's what I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to, when, so, and so it's, it's, it's getting, your time, your dollars, because wrapped around processes that help you hit the center of the target. You and your spouse, your biggest conversation is not just their moral behavior. And, and what we tend to do is just, we don't have a plan when they're in elementary school. And then when, 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 when behavior's bad in their teen years, it's kind of like we start to force behavior to be right. Here's where, if, if you can aim right at the center and get them close to Jesus, where they have, a, they have their own personal relationship with God, and when they're three and four and five, you're dialoguing with them about, well, well what's the Lord saying to you? What's, what's coming alive in your heart with the scriptures? To, to, and you're having these conversations about Jesus. Then it bears fruit, and you're having less, beha- right now, Right now with my teenagers, I've got two teenagers. And I'm not, t- I, I recognize that by virtue of me being vulnerable and sharing my story, it could be offensive or you could think that I'm proud. I'm opening up with the hope of trying to help. Right now, I'm not having any behavioral like fights right now. We're just, because we're relationally close. 
and they're relationally close to the Lord. And all we have is little whisper conversations. Like we, we've had some moments where we've disagreed or where things, they didn't do the exact right thing. But it's, it's not even me saying, it's, right now it's not even me saying, and you're like, well, just wait, it's coming. You're not in high school yet, boy. What do you think? <laughs> ha, la, la. I know, and I'm risking a lot by saying this, but I believe right now when I look at where I'm at, I believe that this is critical. And this is so big in my heart right now. This is the only thing I want to talk about anyway. And so, but right now, there's, we're able to have, we're able to have behavioral change, not by me putting up restrictions, but by me having conversations about what's the Lord saying to you. And, and then they come back and they say, well, what do you think, dad? Oh, well, you really want to know? <laughs> And honestly, I'm having the time of my life as the parent of, a teen, of teenagers right now. And, and I think that it, it, the root is relationship, their relationship with God. And so when, when they're little, buying journals, and for me, teaching them a way, I'm not saying it's the way, but a way to spend time with God has been one of my highest priorities. One of my highest priorities was not teaching I mean, I just, it's, it's not mostly shooting a three-pointer and it's just not mostly about scholastic things. It's, I'm, I'm all for that. My son, Justice, plays basketball. I was at the basketball game on Saturday. But, and he's, he's, he, has scored, he has scored two Saturdays in a row and I'm crazy proud of him. But I make sure that my biggest celebration is not athletics. And my biggest celebration is not even the, the s- scores on tests in academics, but I go crazy celebrating every, not, and not even behavior, not like, um, not like moral behavior, but I, I work on recognizing revelation, hearing the Holy Spirit, what Jesus is saying to you, your relationship that's real, and, and I'm accidentally seeing them turn into little preachers because they've been verbalizing God's activity for years. Does that make sense? And so I wanna invite you just to kind of define what's the center of the target? Okay, husband, okay, wife, or as we do this and we've got, man, we've got this church to pastor and, but we, we don't get these years back. And when they walk across the stage at post high school, by then, everything's different. They're on their own. These are the years of formation. I am saying to voluntarily have some less influence and less money in order to invest in your young disciples and to teach them how to spend time with God. Teach them to have their, how to have their own relationship. Let them see it. Make the number. I think, I think the number one thing you can do as a family is is talk about what Jesus is doing and spend time with God. On our Sabbath, what we do is I take Renata out in the morning for our date and then we come back and we take all our, all our kids to a coffee shop. And they may think it's a little bit boring, but we actually spend a couple hours at a coffee shop and everybody's just spending time with God. And then we go play at night. So it's for us, Sabbath is pray and play, but I'm, I'm wanting to work that muscle that by the time they leave my house, you know, far more than anything else, the muscle they've worked, the thing, the thing that's, that's, that's deep in them is relationship with God. So I would encourage you to work on connecting their hearts. To, if you get anything from this little session, I hope that you get that. Um, and the last one is this, I would say, fight for their hearts. You're in this season where you get you, they're gonna have everything fighting for their affection. And so stepping in as parents and fighting for their hearts. We were doing a, on our last uh, family bike ride on a Sabbath, um, which is fun. My, I didn't ever use the word Sabbath growing up, but since our, I read a book in 2008 um, called The Rest of God um, by Mark Buchanan, and it was all about Sabbath. And so Renata and I just started calling it Sabbath. And my kids use the word Sabbath all the time. And they're like, it's, it's just fun. They say, hey, dad, can we, I, know, I know that Friday's Sabbath, but on, on Saturday, can we take a half sab? And I'm like, 
what's a half sab? And they're like, you know, half a Sabbath. Like, just, you know? And so anyway, it's just, it's just funny. It's just funny language, but... Um, <laughs> but we were, we were on a bike ride um, on a Sabbath night, and my, my Addie, Blanche, she's a singer, and um, she's, she says, Dad, I've got an idea for a new series at Radiant, our church. So I'm like, yeah? And she goes, take me to church. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good name for a series. And she was like, oh, yeah, Dad, it's everywhere. There's a song called Take Me to Church. And it's on the radio in the coffee shop. It's on the radio when you're in the car. It's on the radio everywhere I go. I hear this. It's like all about going to church. And you should do it. So I'm like, oh, okay, great. There's a, she's like, yeah. Yeah, some of you know. I Google it. It ain't about church. <laughs> Take me to church. I, it, just go Google it. it it's, whoo, Wow. <laughs> Here's the reason. I'm telling you, I could get, you and I know we could go through the horrors of what goes on in the culture. I'm just making light of it because that's a cute, innocent thing. But we, we know that we live in a culture that is after the affections of our kids. And somebody will disciple them. Your children will be discipled. The question is, will it be by you? <laughs> someone's going to say, hey, get into ballet. Hey, get into athletics. Hey, get into, you name the thing, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not talking about if it's good things or bad things. I'm just talking about if it's the thing, Jesus. Because all I care about is that it's, I want them to be disciples of Christ. And I'm okay, but, but I'm telling you, every single marketing firm in America, every industry is after the affections of my child. They're after my child caring about their product, caring about whatever it is they're selling, whatever. And so I, I'm a madman fighting for the affections of my kids, fighting for their hearts. And, I, and, and so I'm just gonna read this, and I know you know this. I'm just gonna remind you with Deuteronomy 6, but just read, let's just read this because I want you to hear it in the message. Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Listen to it in the message. Attention Israel, God our God, God the one and only. Love God, your God with, with your heart. Love him with all that's in you. Love him with all you've got. Write these commandments that I've given you today on your hearts. Get them inside of you and get them inside your children. That's what I'm talking about today. Get them, this whole thing is get them inside of your children. Talk about them wherever you are sitting at home or walking in the street. Talk about them from the time you get up in the morning to when you go to bed at night. It's just this. It's Jesus all the time. Yeah, that's kind of fanatical. Yeah, it's fanatical. We're fanaticals. I'm just sorry. I used to say that when I was 20 and people would be like, now I'm 42 and I'm just like, I'm a fanatic. So are you. Let's just, we are. I mean, that's what Christianity is. Like getting this into our kids is, takes, I mean, it takes work in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Write the songs. Get it in your kids. And I would encourage you with this. You will parent them. You'll, you'll pick a strategy. Everybody has a strategy. You may not have defined it yet, but you'll have a strategy. Some of you will be real authoritarian. One of my best friends, dad's a pastor. We grew up in the same city. My dad was relational. His dad authoritarian. His dad told him, this is the way it's gonna be. My dad said, let's talk. His dad yelled. My dad whispered. His dad said, you're my son, you're gonna wear this and you're not gonna act that way because you have a job to do as the pastor's son. Community church, my dad pastored a little Nazarene church and we took very different paths. I'm just saying, I came out of, I went into high school, by the end of high school, I was wanting Jesus and I was talking to my best friend, my dad, who cried when he talked about Jesus and he wouldn't even tell me what to do. He would just look at me and say, well, what do you think Jesus wants you to do? That was the end. I mean, I, I don't know how vulnerable to be about all this. I mean, I had a moment where I was like, Dad, what do you think of this girl at my senior high school? 
And he was like, what do you think Jesus thinks? I was like, ah. <laughs> I've never actually had one like me before, Dad. It's like, what do you think Jesus thinks? I mean, I, I'm, I broke up. You know why? Because I had a dad that just, he just, just, he's just going to connect me to Christ. It's just, he whispers. He never screams. He's embarrassed by how boisterous I am because he's just, when he teaches, it's seven points. There's intellectual clarity. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> he just whispers, gives lectures. Some will be authoritarian. And, and I want to invite you, be less authoritarian and be more relational. Some of you are just passive. Like, I don't know. I'm just going to dump it on God and pray we survive. You know, like, I don't really have a plan. I'm just going to hope it all works out. I'd invite you to think through it more than that. I'd invite you to think about this more than you think about your retirement plan, more than you care about the equity in your home. Get the equity in your heart and the hearts of your kids to be loved for God. I mean, care about it. Work on it. Some of them have a, some of, you, some of you will be passive. Some will be authoritarian. I want to invite you to this. I see our God as relational. And I think parents do their best when they're relational. I'll tell you this uh, two-minute story and I'll close. I started with telling you that my biggest challenge was um, in planting was my kids. And I uh, have seen God work supernaturally to take care of my kids. And I will tell you this. I believe that God cares about your kids more than you do. And if you'll say yes in obedience to God, be strategic. I believe God will do miraculous things for you and for your children. And my love, people tend to become what the person who's most important to them thinks of them, right? And I have found, I, I have found that people tend to really love people that love what they love. And so you tend to really, when you really love your kids, you tend to really love the people that really love your kids. And one of the most fun things in my own friendship with God in the last three years has, has been God taking my own fear and God loving my kids more than I love them and taking care of my kids in a way and doing things that I, out of my control. We were driving on I-70 east. So I'll close with Colorado Springs to Kansas City, February 2015. Sorry, February of 2016 to plan our church. We were starting at September, so we had five months in town. And Renata, I was driving a U-Haul and Renata was driving our Suburban. And she said, hey, Dawson's not doing well. Um, I don't know what to do. He's really upset. And I said, I'll talk to him. Not, hey, let's control it. Not passive, he'll be fine. But it takes work, takes time. We pulled over. I sent the other two kids who were with me back to the Suburban. I said, when it, Dawson alone with me in the U-Haul truck. 11 years old, there is nothing good between Colorado Springs and Kansas City when you're driving across Kansas. <laughs> Sorry if I just offended somebody. Um, so we had all this dead space to talk. And I, his behavior was causing tension between he and his mom. And so I just said, tell me what's going on. First 20 minutes really didn't get anywhere. So what's going on? About 30 minutes in, you just start to get, you kind of pull on the heartstrings. It's like a thread when you're trying to get into what's going on in their hearts. You know, because they don't even fully know. They're just trying to process it. So I just kind of pull on the heartstrings. What's going on? And, and he starts talking about money. He starts talking about this job. And he said, well, Dad, I don't fully understand. Like, you're not going to have a paycheck? And I was like, that's true. <laughs> and he was like, why would you do that? And it's hitting on all my fears. Because now, this is just the drive to Kansas City. This is the one thing I was scared about. <laughs> and I said, you know, Doss, I really believe that God's going to provide. 
I really believe that uh, God's going to take care of us. And he said, you know, June 27th, I turned 12. It's my birthday. I was like, yeah. He goes, you don't have a paycheck. And I was like, that's true. <laughs> and he said, do you think you'll have enough money to buy me a birthday present? And hear it? You can, you can, you can sense the fear. You can pull on it. So either, so this becomes a great moment in parenting. And I said, well, has God always taken care of us? Yes. Are we dependent on a paycheck or are we dependent on God? God. Do you think God will continue to take care of us or you think he's going to give up on us? I think he'll take care of us. All right. Toss, I'll just bet, I'll just bet you're going to have a great 12th birthday. And he's like, yeah, okay. We got to Kin City. I got sick. We were living in an apartment. And I had an invitation to come speak in Texas. And it was uh, over his birthday. His birthday was on a Monday. And his favorite thing to do is to travel with me. And I said, Doss, your birthday present, you get to go with me to Houston. And he said, he was excited. And I made a little joke like, God taking care of you? Yeah, God's taking care of me. The church paid for his flight. So it was like this cool thing, you know. And I was preaching on Sunday and we we're gonna fly home Monday night. Monday was his actual 12th birthday. And I said uh, to the pastor, I said, hey, you know, is there anything cool in Houston I could do? Uh, just any ideas? I want to play with my son tomorrow's birthday. And the, the pastor said, I have an idea. Let me take care of it. I said, oh, wow, okay. You know, like, <laughs> great. The next day, a man in his church picked us up from the hotel. And this man owns his own business. And he flew us with his, with his pilot in his personal helicopter to a ranch in East Texas. And then, so this man who owns this big company took care of us and we shot guns. It was my first time. And <laughs> <laughs> I was just hoping for like lattes and some theology books, but. <laughs> we shot guns. We fished in his private lake. And then we got on a helicopter to go back to Houston to catch our flight home on his birthday. And I'm in the little headset looking at my boy. And I looked at him and I said, hey, Doss, God taking care of you on your birthday? He gets all teary, big brown eyes like his mom, you know? And he's like, yeah, God's taking care of me. And my, I'm going. And then we got back. He wanted to, when we started a youth group, he wanted to preach. His first sermon, I was helping him with this sermon. And I said, what are you going to preach on? He said, I'm going to preach about how good God is. God wants to give good gifts. And he did his first sermon about how God wants to give good gifts to his children. I've got a prosperity preacher in my house right now. <laughs> yeah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every child of every man and every woman that's here today. And Lord, we ask that you would give us wisdom and strength to parent well. We ask for supernatural activity. We pray that our kids would get connected to you. I pray, Lord, that we'd be able to do the best that we can to disciple them, to protect their hearts, that we'd speak life into our babies. In Jesus' name, amen. See ya.